Okay, I've got two o'clock, so we're going to get things rolling. I am attempting to record this webinar, um, but please don't let that temper any questions or comments you might have for our presenter when we get to that point. Um, this is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I am so pleased to be able to host for you today a webinar provided by Hillary Isabrands from the Federal Highway Resource Center's Safety and Design Team. Hillary is a, a national expert on roundabouts, and I'm going to tell you a little story before I turn this over to Hillary. Um, I've been working over the last oh, six to eight months on teaching my two 16-year-olds that are twins to drive. And when we got to the part about roundabouts, I explained to them what I had learned, that a traditional intersection has 32 conflict points and a roundabout only has eight, and how in a roundabout your conflicts happen at a lower speed than traditional intersections. And my one twin said to me, well, mom, if roundabouts are that much safer, why isn't every intersection a roundabout? And it just made my heart warm because I think that future generations get it. And I know our generations don't like change, but they're starting to get it. And I think that's very important in order to improve, improve safety on our roadways and roundabouts is just one of the tools we have in the toolbox. So Hillary, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you got a great presentation for us today. Ethan. Thanks, Victoria. Can you hear me all right? I sure can. And just all right. real quick before I jump off the audio here, if anyone does have questions during the presentation, you can put them in the chat pod on the left-hand side of your screen. I'll read them off to Hillary, um, and I will open the phone lines at the end of the webinar for you to ask audio questions. All right. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks, Victoria. And just so you know, Victoria, if um, you need to interrupt me at any time um, for a question or if someone can't hear me, just uh, let me know because right now I am just basically looking at uh, the PowerPoint slides. So just uh, don't hesitate to um, stop me if there's something we need to address. No problem. We'll do it. All right. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I hope you are having a wonderful day, um, probably for most of you. Um, you know, it is uh, the afternoon on a, on a summer day, and uh, I to let you guys know I was in Ohio last week. I had the um, privilege of uh, working with a, a small group of folks uh, in, actually, we sat in Hilliard. We were in Hilliard, um, some folks from the Ohio DOT, Butler County, Franklin County, um, and the city of Hilliard, as well as our um, my colleagues with Federal Highway Administration there um, from the division office. So um, I've got some pictures and some video from you that I'm going to, uh, for you that I'm going to share from my visit last week. So uh, again, Hillary I friends, um, I do, um, I'm based out of Colorado, um, but I do uh, get around to um, a lot of states. I am on a national uh, technical services team uh, focusing on safety and design and um, am happy to uh, focus a lot of my attention and time and energy on roundabouts, uh, not only promoting them, but also helping uh, local uh, county state agencies as well as consultants uh, really try to optimize their, their projects and their opportunities for roundabouts. So uh, with the, the, the school uh, season upon us, uh, I've got a couple of pictures here right up front um, uh, from my visit uh, in Hilliard. That is, I want to give a shout out, although I'm pretty certain he's probably is not joining us today, um, but uh, the image there on the right is Officer Brandon Long from the city of Hilliard. He spent some time with um, the group last week, um, as well as uh, helped us um, out in the field as well. We did a field visit uh, to the two uh, roundabouts, as well as the uh, on Main Street in Hilliard, as well as take a look at the new roundabouts um, that are just down the street that are um, partially open now. Actually, they're actually open as single lane roundabouts. And Officer uh, Long was really um, kind enough to give us his time and um, give his perspective. He is uh, in the traffic safety unit, so he does spend a lot of time um, out there on the road um, working with folks, uh, giving tickets, uh, responding to crashes. Um, as well. And uh, this was the first day of school in Hilliard, and he was there helping kids um, get oriented um, uh, to uh, the roundabouts, um, particularly the ones that may be new to the schools. Um, there's multiple schools in, in that area. So it was great to 
to be out there uh, last week. Um, so with that, I'm going to get started. So really, this is an update. I, I visited with some of you who joined the webinar in March, and um, I tried to stay away from most of the things that I talked about in March, because uh, I believe uh, Victoria does have a recording of that, and so you would be able to go back and um, take a look at the things that we talked about in March. So just trying to share some um, new things with you, as well as maybe not uh, new items, but things that are definitely um, of interest uh, to those that are working with roundabouts or interested in roundabouts. So I'm going to talk a little bit big picture um, as it pertains to safety and roundabouts and intersections. Um, I always want to cover the fundamentals of roundabouts. Um, just a, a reminder for all of us uh, as we are uh, pursuing roundabouts, either um, from a project perspective, from a conceptual planning perspective, um, or perhaps as a, as a reviewer of projects. Uh, watching is learning. I really think that uh, the more we can immerse ourselves in how roundabouts are functioning uh, out there on the ground, um, provides us opportunities to be better designers, better traffic engineers, better uh, reviewers uh, when it comes to roundabouts. And this, of course, applies to, to um, designs that are not roundabouts. Um, it could be other aspects of any of our, our roadway um, segments or, or intersections as well. Again, I'll talk about what's new, um, education for all, and then um, that's a, um, some inspiration that I also had last week that I'll share with you. And then what's on your mind? Um, in March, we didn't have too much time for questions and answers. Uh, we paused a few times during uh, the webinar, but I wanna make sure that we've got ample time um, here today um, to cover some um, additional items that might be on your mind. Because if for those of you who might be attending um, the Roundabout Conference in September, which I'm gonna touch on a little bit later, um, that would be a great opportunity uh, for us to, to talk about some of those things too in advance of that wonderful conference that'll be held in about a month. So uh, to get started, I just wanted to share with you, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the National Safety Council, but they released their uh, Road uh, to Zero effort and report uh, that early this summer, actually in the May time, April, May timeframe. And I wanted to uh, mention this because they've got three strategies uh, that they have, they are promoting through this Road to Zero effort on how we can get to zero as a nation. And one of those is doubling down on what works through proven evidence-based strategies. And I'm happy to say that the image there from the video, they actually do mention roundabouts in their very short video as well as in their report as a proven safety countermeasure and how that can help us get to zero. Um, so as you can imagine, this is a very large effort. It, it goes beyond engineering. It includes technology. It also includes our safety culture education. Um, but the fact that they gave a shout out to roundabouts, uh, not only in their report, but also in their very short video clip, um, I've got the link there on the bottom of the screen. I really encourage you to check that out. Um, it, it is a, a touching video that they have put together, um, but do know that uh, we do have the ability uh, to be a part of that effort um, as we get to zero as a nation. Closer to home, I, I want to remind everyone, you know, Ohio does have the strategic highway safety plan, as do all state DOTs in, in the country. Uh, we also have uh, numerous actually local agencies that have uh, safety plans now and are, are working on safety plans. But again, just a reminder that intersections uh, typically is one of those emphasis areas that we see consistently across the country, uh, whether it's a local agency or it's a state DOT in terms of addressing some of their highest crash um, locations on the roadway network. I'm sharing with you some of those goals um, as well as the strategies that Ohio has put together um, as an effort to how they're going to get there. So we know we have a problem when it comes to intersections. Well, how are we going to get there? And, and I will note here that it's not only engineering, it's also the education aspects that are, that are really important. So um, I'm going to actually read uh, a portion of some of these bullets here. So it's advancing the use of new technology and roadway designs that make intersections safer. So we know roundabouts fit right into that bullet. Um, 
implement proven and low-cost uh, systemic and, uh, and systematic safety improvements to reduce intersection crashes. And again, roundabouts, uh, we know that they are a proven safety strategy and they, they can be applied um, uh, at a systemic level uh, for, for some agencies. Educating roadway users on the types of crashes that occur at intersections and intersection types, uh, as well as um, the laws uh, surrounding um, intersections. And then conducting high visibility enforcement, media campaigns, and public outreach at selected locations with a significant number of intersection crashes. So these are all things that really um, roundabouts can be a solution uh, and address uh, intersection is issues. And, and do remember that that is a part of the strategic plan for the state of Ohio, uh, and as well as that can also be a part of, a, say, a local safety plan, whether that's at the county level, a township level, or at the city level. So stepping um, down and, and getting a little bit more into the weeds now, as um, we're going to basically, I'm going to give an overview uh, and just a reminder to everyone on the fundamentals really around about what makes them so safe. And I really appreciate Victoria sharing the story of, of uh, working with her children as they become new drivers. And, and them already having a sense for um, perhaps uh, why wouldn't we why wouldn't we put things on the on the roadway network that are safe? Um, I think that that's a that's a great uh, story to tell. Um, and I appreciate I've got my children are a little younger, um, but every once in a while we will also be driving. And uh, my daughter said to me once we were sitting at a, a traffic signal. And, you know, I probably said something like, gosh, this is a long red light. And she said to me, well, mom, why isn't it a roundabout? Why can't you put a roundabout here? And I said, good question. So sometimes it's just those fundamentals. And it takes um, just like a lot of things in, in our lives, uh, whether it's seatbelts or car seats or bike helmets or whatever it happens to be, it takes a generation. So um, we shouldn't forget that we, should, we can educate um, all, uh, everyone in our community no matter how young or how old they are. So back to the fundamentals, um, just wanna share with you, we know that well-designed roundabouts save lives. And that should be something that we always keep in the back of our mind as we're making decisions and we're helping others make decisions about whether or not the roundabout might be the preferred alternative. And as we look at perhaps uh, comparing roundabouts to other alternatives, doing a life cycle cost analysis, um, at the end of the day, we do know that roundabouts um, really can be uh, very beneficial uh, to, to all, all drivers and road users. So speed control and speed consistency are very critical. Um, we, we do want to try to get um, our design so we have drivers going between 15 and 25 miles per hour. We know that that's a safe speed um, for our users, um, all users and all types. We also know it is a speed uh, where if there is a conflict or someone does something um, incorrect, that oftentimes a crash can be avoided. We know that single lane roundabouts only have eight vehicle vehicle conflict points. Again, that reduction in conflict points is paramount to that safety that we are able to achieve with roundabouts. Right sizing the roundabout to fit the context and the users will avoid over design. So it's really thinking about right sizing uh, we are oftentimes limited. We are often in very constrained environments. And even if we're not, we should really challenge ourselves to come up with a design that keeps those slow speeds for all users and really is in, within the context of, of where that intersection is going to be. We know that phasing, design, and construction can also reduce the risk sometimes with traffic projections. So we're not always that accurate when we're looking 10, 15, 20 years out when it comes to those traffic projections. Yet we make very critical decisions when it comes to ultimately the number of lanes that we're choosing, uh, the, perhaps the alignment and some of the other geometrics that might play into a particular project. So we really have an opportunity as a profession to, to look at that a little bit more closely. And if we're more confident at the 10, 15, or 10 or 15 year horizon when it comes to the traffic volumes, perhaps we should focus on that and look at a more phased approach. We've got numerous states 
now that are actually putting that into their design guidelines where they're looking at that more phased approach and that right sizing in terms of trying to, to make sure that they have the most cost effective, safe and efficient project. So these are kind of the top five. If you remember, if you joined us back in March when uh, I gave the presentation, um, I, I gave a kind of a, uh, the elite eight for roundabouts. And some of these are, are repeats from that, have been refined slightly. Um, but these are just some of the really the fundamentals and basics that we need um, to make sure that we keep um, in the forefront as we look at our projects. So some of the roundabout design essentials or fundamentals or principles, some people might call them, um, is you know, really addressing that approach alignment. Do we have a radial alignment? Do we have an offset left alignment where we have that ability to drive those speeds down right as the driver is entering the roundabout or that entry radius that we're designing? We know that the theoretical fastest path is something that we are always uh, checking um, it, it tends, uh, you know, these all tend to interrelate with each other. Uh, we know that the more lanes we have, sometimes um, the more challenging that that can be. But that's something that we are checking, that we are looking at always um, as we create our designs our, and as we review designs. Of course, the natural path is assuming that a driver is staying in their lane and they're obeying all the, the laws and the rules of the road. Um, we need to look at that too as we, as we approach our design. Um, and, and again, address some of the uh, constraints and users uh, that might be there for our project. Deflection is something uh, that we have talked about for a long time here in the U.S. Uh, in terms of deflecting the drivers around the center island. Again, that's part of that speed control. Um, it is interesting to note that uh, some of the, uh, I guess, a, a newer approach or a new type of roundabout design or the turbo design um, does challenge us a little bit in that area. Um, there's a little bit different type of design that goes along with a turbo roundabout. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that here today, uh, but it is something um, to think about as you might be pursuing um, a different type of design, such as a turbo roundabout, where you, you do see less deflection. Um, but there are other features uh, that are there for speed control uh, for that type of a design. Sight distance, of course, is critical. Looking to the left, we've got um, yielding to those drivers coming from the left. But sight distance is also very critical for our pedestrian crossings, whether it is on the approach that you um, are driving on or as you are exiting the roundabout, either with a right turn or a through movement or a left turn. Sight distance, so in that case, where the landscaping is, can you see a five-year-old, uh, someone in a wheelchair? Can you see someone that has a, in a walker? Can you see someone on a recumbent bike that might be coming through that crosswalk? Those are all components of sight distance that we should be considering and thinking about, as well as making sure that those are sufficient with our designs, not only right at construction year, but again, when we talk about landscaping and uh, trees and, and, and grass and bushes, um, those grow over time, and if there's not a good maintenance plan, um, there can be issues with that. So, again, I know many of you probably on the call today are very familiar with roundabout designs, but it doesn't hurt to, um, to always be thinking about these sorts of things um, as, we, as we are working on our projects. View angles so the, the, and entry angles, so the relationship between how the driver is interacting with the other approaches. And um, again, sometimes if you've got a skewed intersection, it can be extremely challenging uh, in terms of uh, that, that geometry and that relationship between one leg and another, what the driver is seeing, what the driver is feeling, and how we're communicating to the driver um, how to, to, again, take a gap, perhaps, or to navigate through that intersection. And on the skewed intersections with those, uh, maybe an obtuse angle, sometimes if we're not careful, uh, we might give the driver the impression it's more of a merge condition versus a yield condition um, as they're entering into the roundabout. So again, these fundamentals are, are critical. Um, no matter if we're in an urban environment or rural environment, um, whether we've got low volumes or high volumes, uh, these are really the, the um, essential components that we should be looking at, um, no matter um, who you are as, as a designer. 
variables that affect footprint, I think this is also another piece that we've got opportunities going back to right sizing the correct context depending on where you are, um, who your users are, whether they're on foot um, or they're um, on an, driving an oversized overweight vehicle. So we know that the vehicle is, is component, the design vehicle is, is, is critical. Uh, we know that there's other controlling uh, vehicles. It could be farming equipment. It could be that oversized vehicle. It, it might be the ladder truck in your community or perhaps a school bus or a city bus. Even though they're not the design vehicle, oftentimes these other controlling vehicles can really actually shape your design. Uh, and we really should be paying attention to that as we are uh, working towards uh, the ultimate uh, final design. Of course, the number of lanes can affect that footprint and that size, and that's where that critical um, analysis and the critical review of the traffic volumes become so important. Um, it's very common that I have uh, folks that will come to me and say, Hillary, hey, can I send you a design? I really want you to review my design. Um, you know, again, the geometric piece, and I'm always going to ask, can you send those traffic volumes with me? those turning movement counts, because that's actually where we should all be starting. Even if your role is the design piece, it's really important um, that the traffic folks understand design and the design understands the traffic, because ultimately that is what we're going to be looking at to determine the number of lanes, maybe not only during construction, but um, the construction year, but also the design year. Approach geometry, I touched on alignment. Um, you know, uh, how long should that splitter island length be? Whether it's a, fi a 50 or 65 mile an hour approach or it's a 25 mile an hour approach, what's acceptable? Um, and how does that affect my footprint? Sidewalks, crosswalks, multi-use paths, bike lanes, those are all other features that also can affect my footprint. Sometimes we get so focused on the, the diameter uh, that we don't think about all these other pieces that really can uh, make or break a, a project potentially. And we have a, a range of values that we can use uh, for our roundabout designs that we should really be challenging ourselves perhaps uh, maybe to start a little bit lower in that range um, versus starting in the middle or towards the high end to, to really try to right size that project, um, have an efficient um, project, a safe project, uh, as well as a cost effective project. Why are peer reviews good? Um, I like to put this out there because I think uh, many of us are uh, continuous learners. Um, we start learning at a very young age and even as professionals, as we maybe have a niche or an expertise, we can always be learning. And that is really important. You can always learn from another person. Um, and again, it, that person might be new to the, to the profession or they might be um, someone who's been in the profession for very long. Uh, and, and for the most part, even though roundabouts, we've had them around since the early 1990s here in the U.S., um, we still are learning. Uh, we still are fairly new compared to our counterparts, our international counterparts. And so it's important to soak all of that information in um, from those who are working on projects. You know, some of the new engineers and, and practitioners and planners that come out of college they still may not have been exposed to roundabouts in their design curriculum or in their traffic engineering classes or their safety classes. So it's, it, it's not necessarily assumed that they're going to walk out of, uh, out of college uh, with the knowledge of roundabout design or roundabout traffic analysis. Not every agency has a roundabout expert on staff, and that's okay. Um, that is okay, and, and it ultimately it does, I believe, in the team effort, the team approach to ultimately getting to a good design. Um, I think good things can happen when we work together um, as at all levels of government as well as with uh, the consultants that are helping us really ultimately get to that um, project. Again, you can learn a lot from a peer review, and it can make you a better peer reviewer or designer in, in the future um, by, by listening to others um, and because and every project is, is a little bit different. A review process, um, a, a review in the process can reduce risks and time. Oftentimes I say, you know, gosh, you're coming to me at, at PS&E 
and you're asking for the first time for this project to be reviewed and it's a it's a two and three lane roundabout wow we probably should have somewhere um, at 30% design or even conceptual design maybe had this conversation that we're having now as it's going out the door. So making sure you've got those, those um, critical points along your design project development process where you are bringing reviewers in. Um, because like I said, catching something at 30% design um, with a roundabout can save you a lot of time and energy um, versus finding it um, at 90% say. Reviews can really result in a better project. Um, and whether that's a, a colleague that's reviewing it, um, you know, so if you're at the DOT, it, it's someone that might be in a different district perhaps that has some roundabout experience. Um, perhaps it is an on-call uh, contractor or consultant that can help you. Uh, perhaps it is uh, just reaching out to someone else that you know uh, about a roundabout project. You know, I've, I've got a lot of people that I reach out to um, when I've got a question or I want someone to confirm or deny perhaps um, maybe what I'm seeing with a particular project. So peer reviews can be good, not just for roundabouts, for everything that we do, um, particularly the more challenging the project. Okay, so I think I'm going to uh, maybe I'm going to go through the next um, few slides here and then um, we'll take some time to um, look at some questions. So watching and learning, and I really do believe this. Um, it's, it's just because you've driven through a roundabout doesn't mean maybe you've kind of taken a look at some of the nuances. And if you are a roundabout designer and you are just sitting in your office designing a roundabout and you haven't had that ability to be out um, and, and live it, breathe it, feel it, drive it, walk it, bike it, um, it really brings a different perspective and I think a very valuable perspective um, to us as practitioners. So at hot off the press, everyone, if you were checking your email and you're on the roundabouts listserv, Letty Champ uh, from the city of uh, Hilliard actually just posted a couple of uh, videos uh, for uh, roundabouts in schools. Uh, so this is, of course, the school just started last week there in Hilliard. Um, this is one of the uh, uh, Main Street roundabouts. This is, I believe, the Cemetery Main Street roundabout that uh, they have. You can see the school bus. There's actually uh, three more schools, uh, three schools right there in this area. Uh, so she is, again, um, sharing the wealth. Um, please observe. Please watch this. I had some great conversations with Letty out there. They've got, notice they have the offset crosswalks. Uh, where the uh, crosswalks are at a different location on the exit versus the entrance. It is really interesting to, to watch as people walk, as well as ride their bikes through these crosswalks. And you can see kind of the different dynamics um, that, that occur. So, Letty, thank you so much for sharing these videos. I'm not going to show these, but um, again, if you're on the roundabout listserv, this was posted um, just a couple of hours ago. I do have a video I am going to share with you. This is actually the North Hamilton Road in Gahanna, um, so just north of the airport there in, in the Columbus area. Uh, this is a three-legged roundabout. It actually does have a driveway as a fourth leg to the home on the hill there. Um, this is uh, two lanes on, the, on Hamilton Road. The side road is a single lane that flares uh, to two lanes on the approaches. This roundabout does have rectangular rapid flash beacons at it. Um, there are two crossings on, on two of the approaches, the one we're looking at here, which is the side road, and then North Hamilton Drive. Uh, there is a bicycle actually in the roundabout there in this video, uh, but they are actually on the sidewalk. So I'm going to jump out of PowerPoint here, folks, and hopefully play a video. So, Victoria, you'll just have to let me know if, uh, if yep. it does not work. We'll definitely let you know. And while you're pulling that up, I have a question for you that came in the chat pod. It says, how important is it to collect traffic data at the roundabout after it's been installed? Can designers modify the installed design if necessary, similar to traditional signal timing using turning movement counts? All right. So collecting traffic data after the roundabout is in. I would say that's always a good idea uh, to do that. Now, in terms of how you might modify the roundabout uh, once you have that traffic data, 
um, might be a little bit more challenging because uh, unlike a signalized intersection where you've got the signal timing you can adjust with the roundabout, it really is based on the geometry. So if we've missed the mark with um, either the lane use or the number of lanes, that might be a little bit more challenging uh, than, um, than a signalized intersection. But I do encourage folks to collect that data. In fact, uh, right now, I, I know that there's a couple of efforts um, in Ohio to actually get some drone footage um, where we can do some actual traffic counts and get on various roundabouts in the state of Ohio. I know uh, the city of Hilliard, if you've been to those roundabouts there on Main Street, uh, very, very high volume. I think, I believe if I've got the number right, and Letty can correct me or if someone from Hilliard is on the, on the webinar, about 35,000 ADT. So those, those uh, hybrid roundabouts are handling a lot of traffic. Uh, and you can see it in, there actually is the queuing um, but they knew that up front, so the expectations were, were kind of set there. But I think that uh, collecting the data afterwards is, is an important piece. I think also um, being aware of not just the traffic uh, in terms of the cars or the trucks, but also the, the use, the pedestrian and bicycle use, I think is also another critical piece that we can um, definitely be collecting that data and uh, potentially making some, some modifications. But again, it's, it might be a little bit more challenging because we're talking about geometrics uh, when it comes to the roundabout. And that's why being accurate with your traffic uh, estimates uh, is, is an, a, a critical part. And really, um, you know, taking a little bit more time doing that can be very um, beneficial and valuable. All right, so I'm gonna move on right on to um, another video here, folks. I'm going to close this one, open up another. While you're doing that, there was a question in the chat pod about the roundabouts listserv, and I'm going to send information out to everybody on that. So, Hillary, Great. you might have a ton of new members for the listserv soon. <laughs> okay, I know Gene Russell at K-State will be thrilled if there's new members. So, folks, this is a project, I-5 California. It was hook ramps um, off and on uh, I-5 with a local intersection. You can see it's actually two offset T intersections, an always stop condition. A little bit of confusion for sure um, at this intersection. It was ultimately uh, a developer came in and was looking to redevelop the quadrant um, that would be basically on the bottom of the screen there. They ultimately were looking at a couple of signalized alternatives and uh, as well as a roundabout alternative at this location. Uh, notice this is about the same time of day. This video, again, compliments of um, Baker International and the folks that worked on this project. This is a, uh, in the city of San Juan Capistrano, uh, California. This is uh, Lenovia, Lenovia Ave. Um, so there was a great team effort there between Caltrans, Federal Highways, the city of San Juan Capistrano, um, and their, uh, the developer and the consultant team that worked on this particular project. So here's a nice side-by-side. I encourage you, nowadays, videoing and recording before and after is so much easier than it ever was. These are really educational moments for all of us, not only for the public, but as us as practitioners. Um, how you can see, how you can count the cars, you can look at the cues, and you can look at the difference between the before condition and the after condition, and how much difference um, it, it actually makes in terms of not only the safety, the efficiency, um, not only today, but in the future at a location such as this. So um, I encourage you, if you are able to get those recordings, um, um, to, to do so because they're very powerful with, with the messages um, that we can convey and learn from ourselves. And then I've got one more. This is actually a brand new project that opened up. This is um, on I-35 in the city of Austin, Texas. So the reason, this is a pretty short clip that I'm gonna share with you all, uh, but the interesting piece about this project, there's actually two interesting pieces on this project. One is that it is an off-ramp off of Interstate 35. It does have raised crosswalks with rectangular rapid flashing beacons, okay? So it's actually one of the first ones I know that we have raised crosswalks with RRFBs um, at uh, a multi-lane roundabout. So that's one um, unique feature of this location. 
The other interesting tidbit on this particular project is it actually opened up um, as a as in in terms of the circulating lanes um, with a portion of it being three lanes, a portion of it being two lanes, and a portion of it being a single lane. Um, what you see in this image right here is uh, where the hatching is, the marking is. That actually was originally opened up as a third lane. Um, they have heavy lefts at this location. Um, they did feel they, they made an adjustment pretty quickly. Um, they felt like it was a little bit confusing. Again, this sometimes is that difference between the design year and the construction year and how um, perhaps opening a lane, an additional lane too soon um, might, might be detrimental in terms of uh, driver awareness, uh, driver behavior, and so on and so forth. So let me play this video here. Again, it's not too long. Um, unfortunately, we did, I don't think we got any pedestrians in this particular video, or they didn't, but they are monitoring this particular roundabout. And uh, I think they really quickly reacted. Here's an example of really quickly reacting to how it was performing and making, it, making an adjustment. Um, so kudos to them for watching it, observing it, learning, and, um, and then doing um, some uh, mitigation, um, someone, some folks might call it, okay? So that's sometimes the importance of, of making sure opening day and design year um, are, are, you've got some consistency there. So I'm gonna pause here, um, open it up for any more questions, Victoria, that might be in the chat pod before I move on. We don't have any more right now, so I'd say keep going. All right. All right, so what's new? So what else is new? Um, so some ongoing and new roundabout projects. I just wanted to let you all know that Federal Highway's pooled fund study uh, the particular project, uh, driver is failing to yield at multi-lane roundabout exits. Um, that project is officially should be getting underway fairly shortly. The link there will show you the, st the states that are a part of that pooled fund study. I may not have this all right, but I believe it's Connecticut, Georgia, Wisconsin, and I'm missing at least one other state, so I apologize to the fourth state. And, and then Federal Highways has also contributed some funds to this particular project. So um, Wei Zhang from our, our research group uh, within Federal Highway Administration is going to be leading that effort. But again, um, it hopefully will be kicking off fairly shortly. Another update is officially the NCHRP uh, project, which will be the, the, the development of um, the roundabout guide and update to that guide. Um, is officially underway. Uh, the, you can also go to that website. Uh, the, the contracting team that will be working on that project is going to be led by Kittleson and Associates. Um, no stranger to roundabouts, and so everyone's really looking forward to the effort um, that is underway. As you guys know, there's dozens of research reports that have come out in case studies since the uh, publication of NCHRP 672 that was done in 2010. So. Um, I think we're all anxious uh, for that project to get underway with hopes of 2020 um, having a new guide um, if, if possible. The other project I wanted to make sure that um, you all are, are still aware of is that the Roundabout and Channelized Turn Lane Accessibility Workshops, they are still ongoing. This was a part of um, NCHRP 03-78B, which ultimately became the uh, NCHRP report 834, uh, which looked at the, the uh, multi-lane roundabouts, channelization, as well as accessibility. So the efforts uh, are still underway with those workshops. I believe in September, October, and November dates are still out there with locations. If you are interested in checking out those workshops, that website link will get you to additional information there. Also, I want to make sure that um, everyone is, uh, the TRB Standing Committee on Roundabouts does um, have research uh, problem statements that are out there. If perhaps if um, you work at a university or a, a DOT and you're interested in knowing some of the topics that um, are out there of interest related to roundabout research, uh, please check out that website uh, for additional information. And although I don't have it up here because it's not new, just a reminder to folks that uh, the uh, past roundabout conference uh, information, uh, the international roundabout conference that was sponsored by TRB, that information is um, on the Teach America website where you can find recordings as well as uh, papers for the roundabout conferences, the, the past roundabout conferences. 
I want to let you guys know that there is an effort underway uh, with the Ohio DOT to update some of the roundabout guidance that's currently um, that's currently in place, but just doing some updating and some some fine tuning. Uh, again, last week uh, we had an opportunity to work um, with uh, some ODOT folks on uh, what might be in that update. Some additional guidance uh, for users that are using uh, the roundabout or using the the roundabout guide that is in as a part of the intersections chapter um, in the design manual. So look for that in January 2019. Uh, the design group um, is leading that effort with ODOT. I've mentioned intersection control evaluation po um, policy development before um, to, uh, in previous webinars uh, for Ohio. But I wanted to mention again, uh, Ohio is looking uh, at the possibility of the development of an intersection control evaluation policy. Uh, the states in dark blue there are ones that, that do have current policies. I'm happy to say that Pennsylvania actually just finalized theirs. I don't know if it's public yet, but I just found out that information a couple of weeks ago from Mike Castellano um, from our Federal Highways Division office. So again, you can see those additional states, uh, the, the kind of um, bright blue are um, developing policies, and then um, the, the light blue are interested in, um, in the ICE policies. But again, it, it is a data-driven performance-based framework um, that helps us look at intersection alternatives and really tries to help us streamline that process. So most states that have them currently, it is a two-stage or two-phase process. Stage one or phase one really is, is um, the new part. Phase two, we're really already doing that. Um, we're really, that's already part of our project development process, but phase one is helping us screen out alternatives early on and not pursuing too many alternatives. It's also really putting some teeth in uh, looking at uh, the, the newer type designs or innovative designs, which some might say would include roundabouts, diverging diamond interchanges, restricted crossing U-turn uh, intersections, and other median uh, U-turn uh, uh, concepts that you might have. So phase one, again, um, is really intended to screen out uh, or screen in, for that matter, um, uh, intersection alternatives uh, that are the most viable uh, based on performance metrics. So performance metrics being operations, safety, uh, environment, cost, um, as well as uh, the um, preference and the context of the particular project. Some of the tools to support ICE that are out there, I will let folks know that Federal Highways, for those of you that are, interested, are, that are familiar with CAPX, we have an updated version of CAPX, which is also really a high-level planning tool uh, for looking at various intersection and interchange alternatives. That's going to be updated under Jeff Shaw's uh, group with uh, Office of Safety Headquarters, Federal Highways. They're also under development is the SPICE tool which again is a, is a tool to help you vet the various, um, uh, vet the safety uh, benefits uh, for the various intersection and interchange alternatives. I also want to note that Georgia DOT has a really nice tool in addition to the traffic analysis spreadsheet tool that some of you might be familiar with that they have that's basically uh, using the highway capacity manual equations in a spreadsheet form. Uh, this tool is similar to that uh, but it does look at uh, the performance metrics associated with the various intersection types. It has kind of some checklists in there, a very comprehensive tool. Again, uh, we had some discussions last week with Derek Troyer um, as well um, uh, about how this might fit into uh, the future for Ohio DOT. And although this is not New news, I just want to remind everyone that the Highway Capacity Manual 6th Edition um, does have the updated capacity models uh, for uh, single lane and multi-lane roundabouts. There are limitations. Um, just make sure that you know if you are pursuing a, a three-lane roundabout um, that the Highway Capacity Manual uh, is, is really not able to help you because we just don't have enough data and information on three-lane roundabouts here in the U.S. and how they're operating at capacity. So that's where we still have to lean on our international partners um, with Australia, the UK, um, to help us uh, do a, a vet uh, and do a safety analysis with anything uh, more than uh, two-lane roundabouts. 
And then also just another reminder um, that uh, there was a three month period where we were not able to use rectangular rapid flashing beacons, um, but we are now with that update March 20th, 2018, there is a new interim approval for rectangular rapid flashing beacons at crosswalks. So in case you did not know that, uh, do know that that, um, that is back in our toolbox um, and we're happy to have that as an option at multi-lane roundabouts. Hillary, question for you in the chat pod. Yes. That worked perfect. Um, will you be describing how to do bike lanes in a roundabout? So I, I don't have anything in here, but I would be happy to answer that question. So bike lanes in a roundabout. So um, just kind of the, the general gist of bike lanes, um, how we look at bike lanes and how they work with roundabouts. So typically if you have a bike lane or even a shoulder on the approach to a roundabout, we, the, the, the guidance that we have in the U.S. or we've had in the U.S. Um, and again, learning from our international partners is that we would drop that bike lane um, in advance of the circulatory roadway. And, and in NCHRP 672, um, it provides some uh, dimensions on, on where and when you would start to drop that bicycle lane. Now, by dropping that bicycle lane, that means that the bicyclist has two options. The bicyclist can then signal to get into um, the, the, the lane, um, the driving lane, perhaps we might call it, uh, and travel through the roundabout just as any other type of vehicle would travel through the roundabout. Um, the other option for the bicyclist, and it might be, it might be a comfort thing, um, maybe a, a rider is not comfortable merging into traffic, um, and they're more comfortable basically taking a bike, um, a bike ramp that would connect to pedestrian or multi-use uh, pathway infrastructure, and then that particular bicycle, bicyclist would have the option to navigate through the roundabout in the crosswalk with pedestrians. So that would be more of a mixed environment. So we do not carry roundabouts, through, uh, excuse me, we do not carry bike lanes through the circulatory roadway. So if you can just imagine um, if we did do that, all the additional conflict points that would exist if we kept a bike lane in the circulatory roadway. So if you want the bicyclist to be in that bike lane, and you're in the circulatory roadway, what happens when that bicycle wants to go to the left and the, the car next to them wants to go through? So we've created additional conflict points with that bike lane. That's why the bicyclist either has that option to uh, move in with uh, the vehicular, the other vehicular traffic and, and travel through, yield on entry. They're gonna follow the same rules of the road as anyone else is, um, or they can basically come become a pedestrian and navigate through uh, the, the sidewalk network as well as the crosswalks as, um, as more of a, a pedestrian than as a vehicle. We don't have any other questions in the chat pod right now, but I did put the number of that report that you mentioned in there. And I've also put a link to how to sign up, sign up for the roundabouts listserv that'll be sent out after this webinar as well. Thanks, Hillary. Okay, thanks, Victoria. And just another note on the um, bicycles and roundabouts, and this is actually a good picture, the picture on the, uh, the right there with the student walking in the crosswalk where you've got an offset, um, the offset crosswalk there, is it was interesting to watch this location because the kids that did choose to ride their bikes, um, that was a pretty sharp turn in a short area uh, where I would always, encourage and help educate um, anyone, not just a student, but anyone riding a bike, dismount the bike and walk the bike across. Um, whether that is the jog in there or it's straight across, the jog helps prevent um, a bicyclist from just jutting out and going straight across. Um, but I also think that the, it absolutely is the safest way to get through not only this, this location, which happens to be a roundabout, but other crosswalk locations um, is to dismount and walk that bike across. I know where my children go to school, um, it, it's the rule of the school that kids cannot skate, scooter, or ride their bikes in a crosswalk. They must pick up, um, pick all those up or walk your bike across the street because they feel like that's the safest way um, for those students to be navigating in the crosswalks near the school. So um, just an added note there on bicyclists and roundabouts. 
So let's talk about education for everyone. Um, we still are in, a, a, I guess, a, a mode of um, educating engineers, educating planners, educating professionals about roundabouts. Uh, we're educating decision makers and elected officials about roundabouts. We're also educating the public. And um, depending on who you talk to, um, in, in a sense, we may have missed the step. Um, and it's not just roundabouts. It might be, um, you know, pedestrian hybrid beacons or diverging diamond interchanges. How much do drivers really understand um, some of the rules of the road, so to speak, when it comes to these more um, non-traditional or innovative um, type intersections that, that people have not been driving for, for decades? Uh, so we need to think of ways uh, to, to educate uh, everyone and be educating all the time, not just when there's a project on the table. Um, kind of stepping back and making sure that we've done our due diligence um, with the education. And if you are an engineer, um, and not to, to the stereotype, but you know, communication is, is maybe not a lot of our strong suits. Um, it, it just it's it's something that um, you know we didn't have a whole lot of communication classes in college. At least I didn't. Uh, so that that maybe comes um, comes second to maybe that technical uh, ability that that we might have. So it's working with our agencies, working with folks that communication is their expertise, and combining that with our expertise as designers, as traffic engineers, um, to basically educate um, all users uh, um, with anything new um, or different. So here's an example here. I've got the link on the bottom, and I'm going to let you guys go to the story. But this is a, a project, uh, not a project. This was an education piece that a couple of uh, uh, Federal Highways folks, um, Jeff Patton and Marcy Allen in our uh, Montana division office, they worked with a local Cub Scout group to set up a bicycle, round, uh, bicycle roundabout rodeo to help educate uh, their uh, students, uh, their young children, uh, about roundabouts, and they tried to do it in a fun way. You can say they set it, see that they set it up with cones, they set it up with hay bales, and those kids had fun riding through the roundabout. Um, you can see there's actually, they had to ride through an intersection too with stop signs as well. So on the bottom again, there's a link there that you can um, look at the, see the news story about the uh, Helena, Montana Cub Scout Bicycle Roundabout Rodeo. Just a shout out to Carmel, Indiana, for those of you who may not know that they hit their 100th roundabout in their community. Um, they've also put out some nice publications, uh, so, and again, some information um, to the traveling public that I think is really helpful uh, to communicate that message and continue to communicate. So here, Carmel, Indiana has 100 roundabouts, and they're still finding different ways to educate and communicate with their traveling public. Um, you can see there, one of their statistics there is Carmel drivers save 272 tanker trucks of fuel per year, per year sorry, due to roundabouts. So they've got some fun facts, they've got some driving tips, cost benefits, environmental benefits. So even a city that has 100 roundabouts, they're still out there making sure that people understand how to drive them and what the benefits are of roundabouts. And then Hilliard, Ohio. I'm going to give uh, Letty and her uh, her folks also a shout out for her tackling those roundabout rules. So she's got a great t-shirt on there. Uh, she was out there the first day of school with her t-shirt on, um, observing the traffic near the schools, but really trying to, to educate drivers and have them focus on yielding to both lanes when there's the, um, multi, multiple circulating lanes and choosing the correct lane. Um, so there's folks that aren't, uh, aren't uh, cutting people off um, in the roundabout or as they're exiting the roundabout. So um, she's got a new YouTube, or the city of Hilliard has a new video that's on their website. I encourage you to check that, that out as well. Uh, so just kind of reinventing how we, how we educate folks related to roundabouts. And of course, a big, great opportunity um, coming off last year's 2017 Ohio Roundabout Conference, where I think there was over 200 people. Uh, I encourage you all to, to check out that website. Uh, it's going to be in Gahanna uh, this year. It was in Hilliard last year. 
And again, I'm sure I've, from what I've heard, there's some great uh, topics that are on the agenda for this year. I'm looking forward to it myself and it just being about a, a month away. And if Victoria can hopefully share a little bit more uh, with us if there's any updates on that particular um, effort. So at that, this is all I have prepared in terms of slides, but I'd be happy to um, get your feedback or your comments or questions that you have in the last uh, about five or six minutes that we've got together. At this point in time, I'm going to go ahead and unmute all the phone lines so people can ask audio questions. So if you have a party going on in the background, now would be the time to make sure that they tone it down. I'm just going to start at the top and start unmuting everybody. Um, I'll let you know as soon as everyone's unmuted. And I did put a link to the registration for our roundabouts conference in the um, chat pod if anyone hasn't registered yet you can still register currently we have 205 registrants but we have enough space for 400 we were shooting high this year so um, we're more than happy to host you for the day and there is a fantastic lineup um, including a great number of ohio based projects that um, who knows might be a, a future site for a roundabouts conference We had tons of people on the webinar today, so I'm almost there. Here we go. I found a button to do it all at once, or hold on. Yeah, I've unmuted everybody, but I still have to unmute you individually, sorry. I think I've made it through most everyone, so if you'd like to go ahead and start asking questions, you're welcome to. This is the part where everybody gets really shy, Hillary. That's all right. There has to be at least one audio question out there. I have a question for you. Um, sure. I've had multiple PI meetings, and I keep on coming across the public having misbelief in that the roundabouts are as safe as they are. And even when we give them um, the data, they still just don't believe it. How could I do a better job of conveying the safety improvements um, to them? <laughs> okay, so that's great. So, yeah, even though it seems obvious or you're presenting data, I think one of the things that I think can be the most powerful is having data that's closer to home when you're at public involvement meetings. Because even though you can rattle off maybe what, you know, Federal Highway says or the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety or uh, what's in the Highway Safety Manual, they might say, well, that's fine, but what about here? Or I've driven through that other project and I know that there's crashes at that location. So it, there's other other entities that have actually, um, you know, taken their roundabouts in their community or near the community, and they've done that before and after analysis. So they, they know what kind of crashes they had before, and they know what they have after. Yes. And I think yes, that I that can be pretty powerful. Um, I know that there's actually a project, one of the very early projects in the 1990s um, in Spokane, Washington. It was a rural roundabout on a high-speed roadway. And we actually, I worked with Washington DOT just a few months ago. We went back because we were actually going to a public meeting and um, we were able to lay out basically a 15 year crash history of that intersection. And it was pretty unbelievable the difference between the before and after. Now, not all projects have a significant before and after difference. Perhaps there wasn't many there to begin with. Um, but I think having some local information, so you do have um, obviously resources um, within the, the state of Ohio where you could tap into agencies that have roundabouts and you can ask them for their before and after data if you don't have access to them. The other a great little article that was just written um, from Connecticut DOT, it, actually the Connecticut Local Technical Assistance Program, so Victoria's counterpart in the state of Connecticut, um, they put out a great how many lives and crashes have been saved since they put in their roundabouts. So, they, again, it was a before and after. 
um, just looking at the numbers before, the numbers after, uh, specifically honing in on injury crashes and fatal crashes um, versus what it's like with the roundabout itself. So I think the more local you can get um, with your information, um, sometimes that can resonate more. Some people will still challenge you, um, but I think that that sticking, standing your ground, sticking your ground, sure. and repeating uh, reduce conflict points, lower speeds, and uh, re reduce severe crashes. So repeating those key pieces is another way um, that you can, you can just reinforce uh, what you're already talking about with safety. I know it's 3 o'clock, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I'm sure, Hillary, you wouldn't mind if anyone still had questions and wanted to stay on the line. So for those of you who need to leave us now, it is three. Um, but what other questions do we have from the audience? Everybody's still unmuted. I would ask, uh, what is the biggest challenge you right. typically hear from the public, and how do you respond to it? Or what is so the, the biggest, biggest question or concern you hear from the public? If they oppose the idea of a roundabout, is there a a most common reason you hear? Oftentimes it is the safety, it, oh, that, well, which, which is interesting, almost ironic in the fact that they, challenge, they tend to challenge the safety piece the most. And we know that actually the roundabouts bring that safety um, to the table more than, you know, most of our other intersection types that we actually have. So something that is so fundamental to a roundabout. That's the game changer with the roundabout is what oftentimes I think is challenged the most. Um, they, and it's part of it is, is perhaps they're not familiar with them, they've never driven them before, or uh, we have some folks that might be familiar with traffic circles. Um, and again, traffic circles, most of those are, 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 are being actually retrofitted to uh, the modern roundabout with the modern roundabout features. So I would still say that safety is okay, challenged the most. Um, but we have national data. We've got local data. Uh, Federal Highways did a study actually looking at, um, even looking at the, the fatal and injury crashes that have occurred at roundabouts um, and, and tried to, you know, we're very transparent um, in terms of what, um, what's out there. And, and, you know, Federal Highways believes in roundabouts. We believe that it is a safe intersection design. And we continue to have data to, to back that up. Um, now, I know there are some uh, roundabouts, multi-lane roundabouts that do have some property damage only uh, crash problems at them. But again, it's, it's, it's hard to find even with those projects uh, where there is a, there's been fatal and injury crashes that have resulted um, after a roundabout has been installed. So again, it's it's sticking to your message. It's knowing the facts and being very confident in those facts um, and acknowledging if there is uh, a project nearby that maybe is having issues, acknowledging that and knowing that before you go into the public meeting so you're not caught off guard. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Is there, um, are there any other questions for Hillary? If not, she will be here in September, and we thank you for that, Hillary. And thank you so much Absolutely. for taking the time today to provide this great webinar. There's tremendous interest in Ohio and continuing to grow our roundabouts. So we really appreciate all your support and the fact that you don't mind coming to visit us in Ohio frequently. No problem. It's my pleasure. And um, like many things, it takes a village. And um, with, with these partnerships, um, we can absolutely uh, take on on the challenges so we can make sure we've we've got roundabouts on the ground, we've got uh, safer roads and safer intersections for, for everyone. So thanks, Victoria, and thank you, everyone, today. Thanks. And I'm going to go ahead and end things now. We'll send out a link as long as the recording worked. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.